welcome everybody. Welcome people in real space and welcome people in two-dimensional space. Thank you all for coming. Uh, and it's very nice today to, to welcome Robert McGreevy, uh, um, uh, who is here by, by chance because he's at the ESS Council. So he's here already. We've grabbed him after we grabbed Paul. And um, it's great to have you here. Um, Robert, I think, will be known to many of you in all sorts of different capacities, I imagine. It, it, up until relatively recently, I think you're currently on the F, working as a consultant for STFC, and you're involved in the formation of the Ava Lovelace Centre, Center, uh, related to data, data and computing and so on. Uh, but before that, you were well known as the director of ISIS, the ISIS facility, which you were director of from 2012, I think. And um, prior to that, you were deputy director at Oak Ridge okay. Laboratory, mm -hmm. uh, from which Paul has come. And um, before that, back at ISIS as a section division leader. Yeah. Division yeah. leader. Yeah. And before that, where does that take you back to? Studs? No, to Sweden. To Sweden, yeah. yes, and Studsvik. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and then before that, to Oxford. That's yeah. sort of all right. I've tried to stack that up in my head, so I hope you have any errors. <laughs> and, um, but a, a warm welcome to you, yeah. and we look forward to your talk. And, Talking about leaks, lens, links, and how we get more value out of all that data. And it's a yes. very topical point and a very, very, very topical point yeah. and a nice, nice alliterative title. So that's exactly, alliteration is the key. For alliteration all. is good. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Great, great, great pleasure to be here. And uh, so, um, ah, oh my goodness. See, we can we can work right. Uh, no, that's the that's the that's the beam, and then it's the arrows left and right. It should work, and uh, no, not working. No. Why are the um, is, is it is the dongle? Yeah. No. Right. Okay. Ah, okay. Yes. So, so I've been giving this talk in very just various different guises for for decades. I'm afraid now this this, this, is, this is the oldest PowerPoint I could find on my computer from 2021. Again, basically the same topic. It's all about you know, that was the SS general meeting in 2020. Sorry, not 2001, not 2020, 2001. <laughs> Um, and while I was still working in Sweden, actually. So uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a long standing problem, data, but also a long standing interest of, of mine. Um, and and I, I think my PowerPoint skills have improved. I don't use Comic Sans any longer. Not, not, not like Colin still uses Comic Sans, but that's. Um, okay, so, so, so we have here Max for the ESS, uh, so, you know, big uh, neutron synchrotron facilities. The, these things produce, are either will produce or are producing very large amounts of data and uh you know just generally i mean we, we what are we going to do with all that data also you're nowadays spending a lot of electricity to produce that data you're using a lot of electricity to quite often store that data to analyze that data you've really got to be thinking about how you get the most value out of that both from an economic point of view and actually now from an energy point of view and those two things are also related um uh, this talk is split into three it's really three different talks and it's different things i'm interested in. so i'm going to talk about data then i'm going to talk about separately about software in this rather different context and then i'm going to, really going to talk about strategy and and i think how at least how we are looking at taking this this forward um but, uh, but i'm going to start with start with data so you know the facilities i just talked about nowadays people talk about terabytes and petabytes etc of data so here's a question for you. When I started doing neutron scattering, what was the relevant unit of data? It's actually the kilogram. <laughs> this, is, this is what we used to take our data on, right? Uh, Fortran or, or punch cards or paper tape. Uh, how, how, much, how much data in cards can you get into a 20 kilogram suitcase? Because the only time I ever completely lost the suitcase were playing, it had my data in it from the experiments at ILL. So, so I had a guess, how much data did you get in a 20 kilogram suitcase? Gigabytes. It's about half a megabyte, right? 20 kilogram suitcase, half a megabyte. So, th so things have moved on, right? You know, it's, things have changed, they've changed quite a lot. Um, just looking at some big data challenges, I'm going to look at how the neutrons and synchrons are different. So LHC, right? LHC essentially collects the same type of data over and over and over again. Every single shot is basically the same. It's the same same data that you, you, you make massive statistics on that. But there is so much data that you've got to start at the beginning saying, we've got to get rid of 90, 90 whatever it is, 97% of this because we can't store it all. So they have this stuff called triggering software, which will look at, look at each particular event or set of events and say, 
okay, we think this one, you know, they're probably missing all sorts of really important discoveries, but nevertheless, they, they have to try and work out these are good events, not good events. But basically, you're collecting the same data over and over and again. And then you can analyze it, you know, for the next 10 years, 20 years, whatever it is, because it's all about statistics of, of the events you, you collect. Uh, so that's one sort of big data challenge, and that's really about the size of the data you're, you're collecting. If you look at something like SKA, which is, which is probably the biggest scientific data challenge around at the moment, that's somewhat different because you have all of the uh, radio telescopes, so half of them are going to be in Australia and half of them will be in South Africa. And yes, they're simultaneously collecting radio data, but there you want to correlate all that data. Now, it, it, it used to be in the past that you, you would say, well, I, I, can, I can store that data, I can do all the correlations later. That becomes a different sort of challenge. But nowadays, you want to do this, this thing they call multi-messenger astronomy, um, which has is, which is really been built up since uh, gravitational waves. We are using all, you know, when an event happens out in the universe somewhere, they want to be able to look at it with lots of different things you know, immediately. So you really need to be able to um, analyze your data from these things you know, within a very, very short time period. And that becomes a very different sort, sort of challenge and, and, to, and to tie it up with all sorts of other data. So that's, that's why, but, it, but it, again, it's still basically one type of data you're measuring from each of these, these techniques. Um, when you're looking at these sort of facilities, then yes, the data volumes are increasing. They're not, they're not actually at the scale of the SKA, um, but, but certainly, if you look, say, compare more to um, LHC and so on, we are getting into the situation, particularly with techniques like imaging and so on, where you're going to have to decide which of those images you want to keep and which of those images you're going to get rid of because you can't keep them all. So you're going to have to have some equivalent of the triggering, right, which will quite often involve nowadays uh, machine learning or something to actually pick that stuff out for that. But the data are very diverse. So, so, you know, facilities like this might have 20, 30, 40 instruments on. Um, they're different types of data. And even for the same instrument, if you're using it, you know, using small angle scattering to do biology compared to do magnetism, what you want to do with that data is then different for those two things. So very, very diverse data. Uh, certainly becoming more instant that you actually want to be able to look at that data, analyze it in some way while you're doing the experiment. So, so you know, for a lot of the, the images and things, you don't want to do the, analyze the images three months later because you want to actually change something in the experiment. Um, so that's what I call instant. And, and, and um, one of my colleagues called this data inconvenient because it's not just lots of data in real volume terms, but actually there's lots of different data files. You may be changing something in your system as it goes along. Uh, so it's, 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 all, it's about the number of different data files, which are, which are in themselves different. They're different times things, they're different uh, states of the sample and, and, and so on. Um, so it's a very different data challenge than it is for either the LHC or, or, the, um, or the SKA. And, and, and actually multi-messenger is the norm. Um, so pretty much all of the people using our facilities will be doing other things with their samples, collecting other data with other techniques. Uh, this, again, these, these, these are graphs we produced back in ESS about 2000, what is it? If I, if I had a euro for every um, person who used the one on the bottom right, then, I, then I, could, I could take you from, we had a great lunch today, but I could take you to the most expensive <laughs> restaurant in, the, in London and still get a really nice one. But, it, but this was all about the multi-messenger thing. Multi-messenger, putting together different sorts of data is an intrinsic part of what we do in the sort of science that we do is extremely important. Although we're not tending to do that instantaneously, we just had a little discussion over lunch actually in a lot of areas, like in material science, the use of databases is actually very limited and that's the thing we have to look at. Uh, this is another graph I produced some, some time ago for a different purpose, but the idea here is just to point out that again, the, the multi-messenger thing is we have lots of different sorts of data coming in where I called it research, there's lots of different ways we can measure data, but that's, that's essentially all we're doing, we're measuring data and then it's the analysis of the data that leads to the value. Right. No, I mean, none of our scientific value comes out directly. We have to analyze the data to get there. Uh, and certainly the, the rate at which you can analyze that data either allows you to do better experiments or, or in fact, the thing I call time to market, right, is, is, is really very important in terms of the scientific impact that it has. If you can't analyze your data for five years, you're going to have less impact than if you can analyze it in five minutes. 
Um, and then you have the, the two things either going around the scientific route where you produce publications, etc. And again, the speed of publication is quite important if you want to make an impact, or indeed to economic impact if you want to uh, get the economic value out of it. But, but the analysis and the synthesis, you know, you're collecting the data and then analyzing it and synthesizing and putting it together, that's the core of how we produce scientific value. So what's the problem? And what are the opportunities? We're, we're measuring more data, no doubt about that, but proportionally, we're ending up using less of it. Now that might be fine, right? But if, if we're not careful about which bit of the less we use, then of course we may be throwing away the valuable stuff or not looking at it and, and so on. Uh, we're actually extracting very little value from most of the data we measure. Most of the data that's measured in the facilities we're talking about, with, with the exception of particular things like say protein crystallography, is essentially only ever used by one person or one group of people or whatever, the people, the people who are measuring it. Um, the, the collective use of data is very, very small. And we can't carry on doing that because, because we are extracting so little value out of that. And as I said earlier, we need to maximize that benefit relative to both the economic cost and nowadays the carbon mm -hmm. cost. Right? And, 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 and those, those, that's a quantitative assessment we're going to need to make because that will become increasingly important. So the opportunity, of course, is that we measure a lot of data. There is a lot of value in that. So there's the opportunity if we get our get cells together. Um, we can certainly add value by aggregating data in databases. And that's, and that's again, in some, in some fields, it's going to be really strange. In crystallography, you wouldn't think of running, doing crystal structures without looking in a database. I mean, how many people would do a crystal structure and say, I'm going to work out where all the atoms are every year. I'm not going to forget about the rest of the world. That's what we do in crystal structures. I mean, I started off studying liquids and glasses, right? There, there are no general databases of the structures of liquids and glasses. You pretty much everyone everyone starts from oh, well, I'll just work out you know for myself where I think where I think all the atoms are. Um, so there's an enormous opportunity there, and but somebody has to fund it. It takes a lot of resources to do that. Um, well, I'll come back to the data, and of course the great opportunity now, once we put those things together, is using things like artificial intelligence and machine learning, either for filtering data in the first place, so what's the good data, what's the valuable data, or then once we put it together, getting more value out of the collections of data. So in a way, AI and ML, you know, just, just collecting data by itself is fine, but unless you can use that aggregated data in an effective way, then, then again you don't get so much value out of it. Uh, this is my favorite database. <laughs> I just want to throw some of these things. This is, this is the Spirit Collection Natural History Museum in London. If you ever there, go, go and see that. They, they have something like 20 million things in, in, in a, preserved in bottles like this. And this is, this is quite a fire hazard, right? And quite a chemical hazard. So there's a special building for that that they put together some years ago. Uh, the biggest thing they have is a giant squid. Um, I, I do have a picture myself I took a, took a bit. But it is what is it, eight meters long or something? That's 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 quite a challenge, uh, preserving a giant squid. Uh, but also the one on the top left, if you have very good eyesight, you can read that 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 says beagle on it. That's one of Charles Darwin's original specimens. I have about half a dozen of those that, that he did. So anyway, I'm just doing advertising for my my friends and that trust museum. It's a it's a it's a wonderful collection. Uh, but it shows the value of collecting data, right? Because nowadays with genomics. Right. In the past, it was just you had all these things and you catalogued them very carefully. Now, of course, they, they're doing genomics on this whole lot um, and getting even more information out. So, so the value of data, um, I mean, to manage data, you do need a policy. Right? I think data policies might sound very dull, but actually data policies are very important. Uh, we're kind of used to this stuff nowadays. I mean, all the facilities, I think, have data policies. Uh, when we wrote the first data policy for ISIS in 2005, the user community were very definitely, you cannot do that for us. You cannot make our data public, right? Mm -hmm. it was, that, that was the, the, view at the view at that time. Uh, you know, 10 years later, it still changed around and public data policies uh, are quite close up with this. But there is still some attitude in some areas that my data is my data and it will always remain my data. And I'm not going to tell you what the metadata is because otherwise I lose the intellectual property. We've got to get over that. And that, that's still around in, in, in some areas. Fair data. So, so you know, uh, fair data is the fashion, um, and does it actually help? So, so fair is whatever it is. It's findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable. Um, lots of organisations. I don't know about Beth and Scott, for audit, You probably say, 
that the results of your funding should be made fair data. Is that the right? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Correct. Um, you probably don't pay people the money to allow them to do that, right? Because it's, it's not. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, um, it, to make data fair takes quite a lot of resources, right? Really. Um, and you know, as I sort of said earlier, not all data can or should be kept. Right. I mean, first of all, you've got to decide, is this data worth keeping? Um, you don't just keep it for the sake of keeping it. And actually, not all data can or even should be fair. Right. I think data should be findable and accessible, because at least then you could do something about it. Whether it necessarily needs to be interoperable and reusable, again, is a value, value judgment, because there's a lot more effort has to go into the latter two bits of that acronym and has to go into the first two bits. And it's different sorts of efforts you have to put in. But it does require resources. And I, I think most of you are familiar with will understand that um, to make data interoperable and reusable, you need the metadata that describes what that data is. You can do the first two really, in a sense, relatively easily in a, in a relatively automated way. Um, but to do the second two, you, you, that's all about the metadata. So what is this thing I am actually collecting data on? And in, again, in some cases of science, that's, I call it relatively straightforward. I don't think it ever is really straightforward. But some of the experiments we will be doing, you're actually working out what the sample was during the experiment. So, so how do you define the math? No, it's a kind of circular thing there. And in a lot of material science, when we have these discussions, you know, people say it's really difficult to describe what was the thing I was measuring. But if you can't describe it, you can't make it interoperable and reusable. Um, I mean, we do have this, this thing about in a way that the, the publication is a sort of paradigm where in a way you say that the publication tells you what was the thing you measured, how you measured it, what the data would came, came out, etc. So in some sense, you think the publication is, is a sort of metadata in itself, so the publication could be regarded as that, but, it, but the publications are always partial, right? We all know that. They tell you a bit about what you did, and they tell you the selective bits that people decided to release to the, to the wider world. They don't actually tell you enough to make data interoperable and reusable. I mean, you can, there are people now who <coughs> write stuff to do data, to do mining or publications, extract metadata from that, produce databases out of that. But again, that gets you part of the way there. It gives you a partial story, it's not a complete story. When you're trying to get people to produce fair data, the thing you have to tell them, first of all, is the greatest beneficiary of fair data is the people who measured it. I mean, how many of us have had students who left and they hadn't written down what it was that they did or where they put the data. So, so just, just being able to find your own data and use it again in five years time is it. And if you're trying to sell to people that they've got to put resources into doing something, then telling them it's a benefit to them, not just to the wider world, of course, helps, helps quite a lot. Uh, but as I said, metadata is absolutely key. So I think we, I think we have to I said, um, no, not, not, not knocking funding agencies, but I say in the UK, funding agencies say, okay, the results of all of our uh, funding has, has produced, they say it has produced fair data, but, but actually mostly it's not fair data, has to go into a database somewhere. And we have what I call data dustbins. That, that is, you know, universities will have, have places people can put their data to satisfy the funding requirements, but it's just put there. It's just, just like a big dustbin, you put it all in the dustbin, it's, it's not actually reusable or anything. So we're actually just storing up, we're just storing up stuff in the store uh, for no real benefit. And I think, and, and again, the idea that data is usable from, I mean, the fact that you measure different data from a particular university, has, there's no particular correlation other than the fact that you work for the same employer, right? You want to get your data into databases that connect together similar sorts of data in, in, a, in a logical way. And that structure is not there in, in most, areas of, most areas of science. So certainly, we should not be spending resources on data dustbins. We should try and do a little, little bit better than that. Uh, giving credit where credit is due is very important. So if you're gonna get people to put data into databases, again, they have to recognize there's some value to me in having done that. Um, and, and that means we need ways of citing data. You know, we're very used to citing a publication. That's the paradigm for saying what people did. But the data, is a, data in this context should be a bigger thing because you might actually publish about a section of the data, but you might put all the data in the database. Um, again, we, we started doing DOIs for data at ISIS in the late 2000s, something like 2009, 2010. Um, and so all the data we measure has, has DOIs, it has a minimal set of metadata associated with it. Uh, how many people cite that data? Even the people who 
in their own publications. It's now, I guess, about 30%, maybe something like that. That's after more than 15 years. It's very difficult to get people to cite it, but we, we need to be having data citation as a standard part of what we do to give credit to people, because otherwise, again, it's an incentive. They, they won't do what they need to do because they don't see, it won't help their career because there's no, you, know, you get publication citations and stuff that helps your career. Your data citations also should help your career, not just link to a publication. Um, so that's a whole sort of series of things about, about data. I think there's enormous opportunities, but we have to put resources into enabling those opportunities. It's not going to happen for free. Uh, now I'm going to do sort of a completely different look at software, right? So it's not directly connected to, and this is just things that sort of particularly interest me at the moment. Um, and so the first one I want to start with, so you might wonder why I'm showing you a picture of a, a ultrasound picture of a baby. Um, apart from the fact this is very cute and so on, and that I have two small grandchildren this year, so it's, it's always <laughs> really cute. Um, so we, we, we kind of had the idea, so this is an image of a baby, right? The, the use of the word imaging. So you, you look at the picture on the right and say, no, that looks like somebody's got a, an old fashioned camera and they, you know, video movie and that's what they took. Um, and then think about how this is actually measured. Actually, if you, you know, you're used to the people doing the ultrasound stuff, there is an enormous amount of very complicated software between the ultrasound measurement and the picture that comes out, even for the one on the left, because most of what you actually measure is, is garbage, right? <laughs> to get the picture of the baby out, you have, you have to get through all the garbage that's in the way. Um, and and this, this image on the right, it, it, it actually comes from a wireframe, right? It's actually a wireframe rendering, just like you have in the movies, right? And, and it's actually deliberately rendered, so it looks like a sort of grainy old black and white picture of a baby, because nobody wants their baby coming out in purple or something, because it's not, not natural. But, but it's, it's, not, it's not an image of a baby. It's a wireframe rendering, just like in a movie. Of the baby, but you're quite prepared to accept this image because it looks like an image, right? It looks like what you're used to. Uh, so, so understanding that, that going from a measurement, which which this is, into a result, which the image is, can involve a lot of software. And, and for a lot of medical imaging, there's far more um, investment goes into the software <laughs> than actually goes into the thing you see, whether it's the CAT scan or or the other stuff, or even the, the other plan like this. Um, so what I'm talking about here really is what I regard as this disappearing boundary between the experiment, the measurement, the analysis, modeling, and simulation. Because in a sense, that that's a, that's a, is a part of a simulation. And an example um, I've been using for the last couple of years is on you know electron microscopy of um, protein structures as, as, as you know, taken off in the last five years or so. Uh, but, uh, but again, a lot of people don't understand what it goes between the actual thing you measure in the first place and the result you get out at the end. So one of my colleagues, Tom Burnley, which in the UK, we have these things called collaborative computational projects, uh, which have been running for a long time. Some of them, um, I mean, you'll be familiar with CCP4, which does protein crystallography. For example, we now have CCPM doing this. We have an imaging CCP. So these, these, these are actually very good examples of very long running software developments on behalf of the community, um, which both develop the software and actually make it sustainable. That's a really important point. This has been, you know, I think CCP4 has been running for probably 30 years, um, producing sustainable software, which is very important. So in, and I'm probably talking to people here who know more about this than I do, so, so please, please forgive me. Uh, so, so what you're doing in the electron microscopy is you're measuring images like the things on the top right, right? It's two, 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 two dimensional sections uh, doing an image within which you have lots of little images of proteins. So it's a two dimensional slice through that and somehow out of that you want to reconstruct a three-dimensional object like on the on the, on the bottom right and then you essentially map into that three-dimensional object what you know um, about the more detailed atomic structure but what you're not doing is you're not directly measuring the thing on the bottom left a lot of people think you are but but you're not actually you're measuring the thing the thing on the top, on the top right and and if you look at this i mean this this is just this is just part of the the, the um, the framework of the bits of the data analysis and software that they use within CCPM for doing it. Again, it's, this is not a simple linear thing where I have one, one program that does this and I go from here to here. Again, you know, most of the data analysis we do at our facilities, people think data analysis is, uh, I measure the data, I run this program, I go run the next program, that comes the answer, that's it. 
and, and start to realize there's all sorts of different things you may need to do for different data sets, putting together lots of different ways of constructing bits of this model and so on to actually come out with, with the model at the end. Um, and, and so some of the ways of looking at, so again, on the, on the top left is, is a typical image coming out of the electron microscopy. Uh, you're trying to take the things you can very vaguely see as uh, the, the, the two dimensional images of, of the proteins. And on, on, on the bottom, bottom left there, that, I mean, that's those stars, is that's just a sort of cartoon version of what you're trying to do is, is to reconstruct that three dimensional object. Um, and within that, you then have, you're trying to produce this real space model like the thing on the top left, but you use all sorts of techniques like Fourier, backwards and forwards Fourier transform. I mean, it's been done in electron microscopy for years. Um, to actually be actually like tidying up your data, getting rid of the noise, etc., in uh, finding the, the real thing. And I, I, I get back to it in a minute. Well, why am I why am I specifically showing that? But a lot of complicated things that end up making that nice clean image you get at the end of the day, because the clean image is not the thing you measured. That's very important. Um, so, so yes, this, this, this comes back to the, 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 nice, the nice protein structure you see is not what you're actually measuring. It's, it's, a, it's a combination of a lot of software to actually go from two-dimensional images into three-dimensional image, three-dimensional images into this uh, atomic resolution structure you get at the bottom. An enormous amount of additional information goes in to producing that, that final answer. Um, now I'm going to connect this to something that I was involved in developing this technique called reverse Monte Carlo modeling a long time ago for modeling structures of disordered materials. Uh, this is this is a GIF we produced of, of doing this in two, I think it's, it's doing in two dimensions. That, that was when animated GIFs were really new. We were very happy about doing that because this was a real modern technique. Nowadays it just looks like like nothing. But the idea is you, you're you're doing a model to fit your model to the data. Um, so that's what we're on the left. We're taking a, we're looking at a liquid structure. And we're actually fitting the model of the liquid structure to the data, starting with the crystal structure. So that's, that's a very simple example. Um, and then going back to multi-mesh modeling, when you actually start doing that on real systems, this is one of the, the systems we did, which was a fast iron conducting glass. Um, which that picture on the left is, is the atomic structure that we, we derive and actually got mapped into that an iron conducting pathway of the silver ions, which is the thing you want to know. And all of that's coming from the data. And in that case, we were using, and this is still relatively unique. We, we did X-ray diffraction, neutron diffraction, two sorts of XFs. We eventually did a non-X-ray -scat scattering and somebody did NMR and stuck it with that. So actually there are six different techniques going to producing a single model. That's still pretty rare, even nowadays, for anybody to do anything of that level. That, that's, that's still good. Um, and I, I really like showing this one because again, this is a sideline, but you know, there's, there's a, those of you who are research scientists will know there's times in your career where you do an experiment that's really exciting. Um, and so we, we, we produced a model like this based on the data on the top left, which is neutron diffraction data. And the peak on the far left, the sharp peak on the far left, all of the literature at the time said this was due to silver clusters in the material. That was the, you know, all the literature said that was the case. We produced our model and the model said, no, it's not. It's, it's due to correlations between the phosphate ions. Um, so we had something that was completely the opposite of what was in the literature. And the answer was, if you went and did the x-ray diffraction data, because silver scatters x-rays a lot, then that peak should be enormous. And if we were right, it should be small. So we started doing the experiment in the top right. I'm afraid you know the answer now, because you can see how big the peak is. But imagine we had a scanning detector, the detector scanning, right? And we start off the experiment, and you can see the peak going up. And the question is, does it go this or does it go like that? And of course, we just went like that. So we're down the pub, forget about the rest of the experiment. <laughs> we we'll celebrate that. That was really exciting to do that. But, but again, you end up with something that's completely the opposite of um, in the literature. But it was illustrating the very important thing about that thing between modeling and experiment, right? The, the, the combination of those two was telling you things you couldn't get just by looking at the data. Um, now, some of you might be more familiar with this, so anybody doing small angle scattering, either x-rays or, or neutrons, will be uh, will know about uh, Dimitri Svergan at EMBL has been producing software that's been very widely used for actually doing, uh, producing the shapes of uh, biological molecules in solution, which are then used, uh, I'll just show you in a minute. Um, this, is what, this is why I can complain about Beth and Scarf it because Johan is here, but he wasn't. Sorry, I keep on getting at you. Yeah. <laughs> but, no problem. So, 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 so in the mid-1990s, before Dimitri developed this software, 
I wrote a proposal for Vetton Scarpa Audits to develop exactly this software, because this is actually a reverse, Monte, what we call lattice gas reverse Monte Carlo. It's using exactly the same techniques um, to do that, but they, they turned it down. So we never developed it, and Dimitri did, and he got well, Sorry about that. That's, you shouldn't have come to the talk, should, should you? Uh, <laughs> no, I shouldn't have. You should. you, it, wasn't, it wasn't your fault. It wasn't your fault. You wouldn't, you wouldn't have known. Um, but this is now a widely used technique in, in, in the small angle scattering area for, in, for biological molecules. Uh, do, do, you know who the, do you know who the first person to write a lattice gas reverse Monte Carlo program was? Kurt Clausen, who, who was the vice chair of the ESS Council. Um, and for a completely different application, not for biology. biology. But um, anyway. And, and that's now used, so, so this is now neutron, based on neutron scattering data, Steve Perkins at UCL studying immunoglobulin. Again, but the, 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 um, the low resolution shapes there, that's done using this sort of software, right, based on different sets of neutron scattering data, and then mapping into that the more high resolution structure in exactly the same way that's essentially being done in the electron microscopy. But the difference is here, you're starting with two-dimensional data um, from diffraction, as opposed to two-dimensional data from image. But otherwise, in many senses, the, the, the principle of what's being done is the same. And I think on the next slide, this is again some of the more complicated software they're using. That's using combination again of X-ray diffraction data and neutron diffraction data. But it's the, it's the same principle as electron microscopy. So again, if we went back to this picture, then the, the Fourier space on the top right there, right? If you did the one-dimensional average of that, that's small angle scattering data. Yeah. So again. It, it, it strikes me as sort of slightly peculiar that people are quite happy to talk about the thing on the left as imaging, because you start off with two-dimensional data and you produce a nice image. And on the bottom right, uh, everyone will tell me that's modeling, because you're starting off with one-dimensional reciprocal space data, and you're producing a three-dimensional thing. That has to be a model. That can't be. But actually, they're basically just using the same techniques. Um, and I think that the main point I sort of, okay, there's, there's one more thing in here. Uh, we've act, actually, again, back in the early 2000s before I left Sweden, uh, we put together these techniques. So we actually had, we did an experiment where we measured the data, we did the analytical corrections of the data, and we produced a model one button press, right? So, so the whole thing happened completely automatically. And at the time, the guy said to me, why are we doing this? Why, 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 are we, you know, why bother doing this? And I said, that's the future. Uh, it's not quite the future yet, but that's what, but that's where we want to get to, right? Is this is, is this you're, you're getting towards that one button press? Well, I mean that happens now really in in crystal in protein crystallography, right? People want the one button press to take them make them well the robot presses the button now, so it's even easier. You press the button, you get the picture of the structure out, you go off and do what you do with that. Uh, in many years, and that was possible 20 years ago from a tiny laboratory, right? We had very few staff, but still. That sort of thing is not really implemented in many places. It could be if we had the resources to do it. Um, but I, I think, think uh, this is another example. You can do similar things. This is um, residual stress measurement. Uh, the, the top left is measured on basis of diffraction. So again, it's a, it's a reciprocal space measurement. You produce a strain map. The, the bottom right one is a different object, but, but that's produced on the basis of imaging directly. These are essentially equivalent. They're just simply in the sense of the mirror, mirror image data collection of the two things because, because of the um, what you're not measuring in the imaging, what's taken out is the stuff that goes into the diffraction, right? So essentially it's the same data, it's just, it's just the inverse of that. Uh, but, but again, you, you, uh, in, in the imaging, you sort of get the picture directly. What you really want to do in the diffraction is to be able to do the diffraction measurement and also get the picture directly because, because you usually have to do both because with the imaging, you can get less spatial resolution and you can with, with, with the diffraction data. But so, so these techniques could be used in very different areas. Um, but also we can, we can go on to look at dynamics. So again, these are things we developed a long time in the past using similar techniques. Again, trying to look at iron, uh, these are iron conducting materials. Uh, this one is sodium hydrogen sulfate. I mentioned the story about lithium sodium sulfate at, at lunchtime. Um, so again, this is based on, on modeling. This is not molecular dynamics modeling. This comes from diffraction data. Um, and but we're actually finding out the, the interesting thing here. So in the top, we're showing uh, three sulfate molecules, and then there's a hydrogen atom being transferred from one to the other. And the thing people didn't understand at the time is if you do spectroscopy, it tells you that you have HSO4 minus ions. Very clear that that's the, uh, that's the entity that's there. But these hydrogen ions are zipping all over the place like mad. 
And actually just from this way, well, because you can, you can see in that little picture, basically the hydrogen gets transferred onto, it's not, it's not wandering around in the middle of nowhere. The diffraction data on the bottom right suggests you have pathways and the hydrogen is just wandering around. They're not, they're actually transferring coherently from one, one molecule to another. Uh, so again, combination of modeling and experiments gives you much more insight than just doing one or the other. Uh, so we, we, we actually went through the process of trying to now combine molecular dynamics modeling with uh, experimental data. This is a really simple thing we, we, we did some years ago. It's actually modeling liquid argon because that was the easiest thing we could do. Um, but there, there is now a project trying to develop this molecular dynamics thing, which is with people from, from uh, well, actually Thomas Holmrod in um, the SS Data Management Center is involved in this, people in Chalmers, et cetera, trying, trying to do this. They, they always want to do water. I never know what everybody wants to do. The worst first thing they want to study is water. And my, my advice is never study water. Water is a very dangerous liquid because whatever you say about water, there'll be another scientist who absolutely disagrees with you. Um, so, so I have never studied water in my entire career because I, that's why I'm still alive. Long time um, so, you know, that, that's, that's a sort of, it's, it's a wander through a number of things that interest me, but what I'm really trying to make the point about is this, this disappearing boundary between simulation and experiment. And it's not just about doing a simulation and doing an experiment and looking at the two together. It's actually combining those techniques so you're very sure they are consistent with each other and getting a lot more out. Uh, so we, we, I, now I'm trying to make the point to people, you need to be much more imaginative about the way you think about experiment and simulation. And so most people have this very linear view on what you're gonna do things. And it's not about, I, mean, I had this argument so many times in my career, people said, well, but that can't be correct because it's a model. And it's like, I don't care if it's correct or not. What I care is, is it's useful to me to understand what I need to understand. So it's about understanding. And going back to the picture of a baby, you're quite happy to accept that because it looks like a baby. So I understand it's a baby and it's whatever it is. Um, but in science, it's, it's actually no different. It's just we haven't seen the thing that is, in a sense, with our eyes that we're looking at. Uh, slightly separate bit there, but um, the bottom, developing research software, any of these things, they need to be professionally developed. It's good that we pay our staff, that's, that's really good, but I mean a bit more than that. You know, nowadays, you're going to put together all these different things. You need a combination of the maths experts, the science experts, you know, the domain, um, research software engineers who can produce efficient data, etc. Um, and it needs to be sustainable because just, to, you know, in, in many of our facilities, we will still have the one person who develops this great data software. And then and it's fantastic and everybody uses it. And 20 years later, they retire. And you, you know, I mean, we can think of examples right now of, of that. And that disappears and we have to stop that that's a massive amount of resource that goes into producing something which which becomes a single point failure so we've got to get used to developing software like in these collaborative computational projects where you have teams of people and each individual has their own thing but it's not one person doing it and and somebody needs to pay for that that doesn't get to be sustainable unless somebody's uh, paying for it and i'm not looking at you again you're not <laughs> you. yes you are <laughs> okay so, so, so in that context, now I'm coming from the, the strategic side to tell you what, what we're doing about this and, and, and sort of why. Um, so, so I'm involved in setting up this centre called the this centre called the Ada Lovelace Centre. There's, there's far too many things called Ada Lovelace. We didn't realise that when we chose the name. <laughs> um, you, can even, you can even buy Ada Lovelace socks, I found out last week. Um, anyway, we called it the Ada Lovelace Centre. And the idea is to produce, it's a centre for research data management and research software engineering. That's sort of very generic for the benefit of our large facilities. So it's very clearly, it's not just developing stuff, it's developing stuff, maintaining stuff uh, sustainably, et cetera. For the bit, we have, we have the diamond light source, ISIS neutron source, we have our central laser facility, and I include computing in that because they're the people doing the simulations, right? So simulations are also themselves data producers. And then, you know, they may or may not be connected, but, but that, that's a big area of data production as well. So these are all data producers. We, we started this in 26, we started the idea in 2016. We got a very little bit of funding, uh, et cetera. So we've had a project portfolio, which is putting about 20 FTEs, about 30 projects, but short-term projects with short-term funding, et cetera. So again, it's not really what we wanted. We wanted long-term um, sustainable out of that. Um, but now we've got funding. I mean, it's taken five or six years to get the idea through, but you know, it's, everybody, everybody understands it's a problem nobody understands how they're going to solve the problem and the problem is essentially you've got to put funding into it 
So we've got funding now to significantly ramp up that activity from, from 20 FTEs. Uh, we will not own or operate any of the hardware. Somebody else is doing the hardware. We, we are, we're about people. It's just about the people doing the software, et cetera, and the data management. I mean, they're, you know, they're, we have to work with the people writing the hardware. It's, obviously, that still has to be done. But specifically in this, our budget does not deal with any of that. Uh, but the, the bottom thing is, is just at the moment, we're small. We will, we will operate as a large uh, program inside an existing department. Eventually, you might expect this to, to spin out into something that was its, its, its own proper temporary entity. Um, why do we need this? Okay, we've already been through the fact that there's lots of volumes of data, et cetera, many experiment simulations, lots of areas. Uh, at the moment, within STFC, we are also invest, investing in development of these facilities. So we have the, the diamond lattice upgrade, so taking it like Mac 4. Uh, EPAC is the Extreme Photonics Application Center, a new laser facility. And actually, there's two other projects, laser policy system funded. Endeavor is the ISIS uh, instrument upgrade program. So together, there's more than half a billion investment in those upgrades. So those, those, those are not small. And all they're going to do is produce more data. Right? So somehow we ought to be doing something about the data. And it, and it really is not effective if we're going to generate all that data. But, but those budgets, half a billion, that does not include, by and large, stuff to deal with the data. And that's always been the case. We always separate out, let's, let's build the hardware, let's fund the hardware, and not do the data later. I, I already talked about energy requirements. Um, you know, in, in, in a, we cannot afford to be energy inefficient any longer, so we really have to think through this. And I've talked about downstream use of aggregated data, which is also um, extremely small. I mean, just, just throwing this as a sideline, when we had, we, I mean, one of the major software projects we had at ISIS was a data analysis platform called Mantid, um, which is now, has now been used in quite a lot of facilities around the world. The only way we started that was when we built the ISIS second target station. And actually, when I moved to ISIS in 2002, it was one of, it was one of my um, requirements that we, we could use 5% of the cost of the instruments, just 5% of the cost of the instruments, not the whole facility, on software. And that's actually where we started mounting from. So that was the tiny little thing that, that grew into a much bigger thing later. Um, but you have to build that in from the beginning. Um, this is not a problem. It's not a, it's not a short term project, right? This problem is going to be with us forever. And I mean, that's recognized. The, the, the Large Hadron Collider recognized that. The astronomers recognize that. They're in a very different position. We're still thinking, oh, I'll get a guy to write a program and then all my data will be sorted, right? This is, this is a long-term problem. And therefore, it requires scale and it requires investment. It now requires a lot of different skills. It's not your one person developing software. You, you want people who, who, you know, who can write special code to either very effectively use HPC or now graphics cards or all these things, mathematicians. There's a whole range of skills you've got to put in that. And if you're going to get those skills, and particularly working for a government organization with, with our problems with salaries, which we all have, et cetera, then you need to have something off scale. You need to be able to attract people. It needs to be an, an, you know, a working environment that people can think, I can go there, I can make a career out of that. Because again, you, you, you can't do this with people who are only going to come to you for two years and then disappear again. Um, and, and of course, the facilities themselves will benefit from the synergies. Right? Because again, if, the facility, if each individual facility was to do this entirely separately, they still need something of similar scale and they can't afford to do that. So putting, putting it together gives you, gives you that opportunity. Uh, just thinking about the scale, the example I used is the European Bioinformatics Institute. That's been around again for 30 odd years. Um, it, it, it's really a world leader in data and software for biological applications. It, uh, as far as I understand at the moment, it has, it has about 500 staff who deal with the data and software side of it, and about 250 staff who do research on the data and software. Um, but that's the scale, and that they are only dealing with two types of data, crystallography and genomics. They're starting to get into imaging because of the electron microscopy, and they, they themselves say, that imaging, that's a hell of a bigger challenge than the crystallography and the genomics, because it's, you know, these, these images are now two-dimensional data, you've got millions of them. Uh, so, um, um, whereas our facilities have a much wider range of data for a start, including imaging, uh, and mostly it's much less well structured than, than crystallography or, gen or, or genomics. So, it's a, if, if, if we need 500 people for this bit of biology data, you can kind of work out for yourselves the scale of the problem for um, the, the type of things that have facilities. And as I said, recruitment and retention is really difficult. So, scale, visibility, 
and reputation. You have to build a reputation so people want to come and work for you and, and stay with you. And you can't do that in little pockets and corners over the place. You're going to have to centralize that. And that has to be something that you can, you can look at and see. Uh, so what our task are to do, we're going to maintain, the, well, we hope to maintain the critical mass. Critical mass is really important because people will come, people will go. You don't want things to fall to bits because you've lost one particular person. Um, and so you have to maintain critical mass so you can, you can keep the extra fees. Uh, mostly we will have a project portfolio, that's how you, how you develop software, but we want long-term programs in particular areas. Um, not everything is, people have thought in the past, to have a project, I have to have something that's used by all facilities. No, it, it, I mean, you have some things that for synchrotron, some things that for lasers, I and mean, you know, particularly lasers doing some very different things. Um, a slightly important second point there, but, but depends how places work. We're, most of us who work at facilities are used to the idea that facility scientists you know, do their user, they support their users, etc. but they also do their own thing for part of the time. There's lots of other types of departments and organizations where you basically just you just do whatever projects you have funding for. I mean, Paul, Paul will know this from, from Oak Ridge, right? The, the departments you go and talk to and say, I'd like to have a meeting and talk about something. They'll say, what cost center do I book this to? Right? <laughs> That's, uh, you've got, if you're going to attract people, you've also going to need to, it's, it's, you can't pay them so much money, like on the market. One of the ways you attract them is allowing them to develop their own things on the, you know, on, on, as part of what they do. So that's a really very important part of our, our structure. And we'll also look for external grants, but the main thing is this work is to benefit the facilities. That's got to be, got to be very, very clear. But the bottom bits are sort of about, about the attractiveness as an organization to work in. Uh, our priority themes at the moment, imaging and reconstruction. I mean, that's, that's a big thing across all the facilities in, in different ways, including the one thing I can't say, pycography. Pi, 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 <laughs> anyway, that, that, that's, that's, that's a big hot thing for the synchrotrons in particular at the moment. Uh, simulation and modeling. So again, out, out of our scientific computing department, we have very big strengths in simulation of, of, of all sorts. That's a lot through these computational projects that have been running for a long time. Uh, obviously, techniques and applications of machine learning and artificial intelligence, and that, that goes from running your facilities and instruments better to just the scientific applications there. Data and metadata management. I mean, th those, those are things where you also need professionalism and you need people to help you to understand how do I define the metadata? How do I structure that? I develop ontologies, etc. So again, that's a professional area of expertise. It's not just about people putting things in this data data in. And services because of course um, these things will have to be provided as services because you know workflows whatever it is people want to be able to come on and along and use those things fairly seamlessly so IDAT is we call data 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 acquisition analysis as a service or so anyway something something like that but it's about providing services and that's a very different set of people who are trying to do that um, and what we're going to try and do is so when somebody comes along and say I'd like to develop a bit of software to do this particular task in my you know, experiments and say, okay, that's good. But what we want to know is where's the data coming from? What are you doing with the data? Long-term downstream, where's that data going to go to? And say, okay, we'll, we'll support you to do this, but we'll also support you to do that, which you didn't come and ask us to do, but we need to do that to get the, the bigger value out of it. Um, and that's a, very, that's a very different approach to the very simple um, single project, small scale approach to do the things people ask you to do. So simulation modeling services, I said data and metadata and so uh, on. Where are we starting from? Well, I think I don't, nobody solved this problem, right? I can't look around and say, this country has got this sorted, right? And we, we all have this problem. So there isn't, there isn't necessarily a place. I'd say, I mean, I think EBI is great, um, but they, you know, they do a particular thing. You can, so we're learning a lot from them. Um, we're not actually very far behind on this. We have some very well-developed long-term things we've been doing in, in our organization for quite a long time, both within the facilities and, and within the scientific computing, but there's a long way to go. There's a lot to do here. Um, so I said, we were a very, very well-established scientific computing department, but they have been mostly been working on funded grants. They get grants, they do work, they get grants, they do work. They don't actually do their own thing. Um, we've got a, a track record. So I mentioned open data policies, for example, I mentioned the, the management and so on there. Uh, we have quite a good machine learning group now, AI. So we started four or five years ago. Uh, there was no, um, I mean, there were, there were individual people who had bits of expertise. And then we, um, again, coming from ISIS side, we actually said that because, because this scientific computing department just works on grant funded work, right? We said, 
I said, we will pay you to recruit four people in machine learning. And then they got bits of money from the other side. And I said, I don't care what they do. They can do ISIS work, they can do some other work, I don't care. What I want you to do is to develop expertise in machine learning. So later on, we can come back and use it. And now they have 15 people in the group and it's supported from all sorts of ways. So that's actually worked really, really well. But somebody has to start and say, I'm going to put some money into this. And that's one thing that the, some of the large facilities can do because you do have some flex, okay, as a director, you don't have much flexibility in how you use money, but you have some. And so you can actually make initiatives that you don't have to ask somebody else for permission to do. So that's how we started that. Um, and, and we now have several years of existing projects, which we're now going to, going to ramp up. Um, so there's lots of collaboration opportunities. I've mean, mentioned DMSC down here, and um, you know, Lynx is another collaboration opportunity. So certainly collaboration opportunities will be very important because there's lots of other people doing that. So I don't have to go through that in, in sort of detail. Uh, apart from the sad fact, we're no longer in the EU. So we're no longer part of EOSC, as we <laughs> discussed earlier. So we're a bit out of some of those collaboration opportunities. Um, but but we, will, we will get in there somehow, right? And, and these things like leaps and lens and initiatives like links are good because then we don't have to go through the EU. We can still work with Europe, not, not the EU. Um, so what are we doing next? So, so we have funding at the moment. From next year, our funding starts to ramp up. And as anybody who has you know, ever run anything tells you, not having money is a problem. But your problems really start when you do have money, you have to spend it. Um, so we've got to start recruiting people. So we're going to have quite a... Uh, a relatively aggressive recruiting campaign, which in the current circumstances is really hard, but everything we want to do depends on having people, right? So, so we're going to ramp up. And the, the really important thing is that STFC, which is our uh, funding organization, has understood this is not funding for the next, I mean, strictly speaking, we have formal funding for the next two years, but they are bought into this long term. Right. This is not a thing that's going to go away. This is a thing that has to be established, that has to run just in the same way that we run ISIS and we run Diamond and we take part in CERN, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and that, and that's, a sea, that's a sea change. That's really is a sea change in thinking about it. This is not a short-term activity. So, uh, so we have to have a governance structure. We have to have all those good things we're putting in. And we are aiming at 100 FTE in five years. That, even that's quite aggressive. You know, it's 20 people a year. That's, um, that's not so easy in current circumstances. But um, okay, 300 FTE in 10 years. Okay, I'm, I'm optimistic and I won't be responsible for it because I'll be really having put my feet up by then. But if, you, if we go back to the EBI you know, example, that's where you need to be, right? If you're really going to use the data from these, from these facilities, that's not including the people in the facilities already who are working in this area. These are additional people, right? So this is really a step change in what we'd be able to do. The strategic lessons that I've kind of learned from this are certainly the scale of the problem is the same scale as a facility. It's hundreds of people, right? It's not a little problem. It's not a little bit of the thing. It's, it's, it, that is the scale of the problem. And you can't then do that within a single facility. It's too big. You, you can't take your budget and incrementally increase it or et cetera, right? Nobody's going to give the facility the budget to do that because it's, say, it's saying, you know, I'm going to double the budget of ISIS or something. No, they won't, they won't do that. So you had to actually say, let's take it outside of that, make it thing, thing on its own. And again, it's not a short-term project. We've got to get over that idea. This is a long-term commitment we, um, and so on. Collaboration sharing, really, really important, um, but you still need resources. It, it's amazing how many people think, I mean, software is one thing that's very transferable between different organizations, right? But you still need people to actually implement it, to, to put it on some machine, to tell people how to use it, to make sure it carries on working. So even when raw software is existing uh, or, or data or whatever, you still need resources to implement it. And again, the, so the sharing of things does in itself require resources. The sharing of things is not, is not, is not free. And that's usually an underestimated actually how much resources it does require to then take somebody else's systems and implement them in your place and make them usable as a user service. I mentioned professional and sustainable, absolutely critical, right? That, that you, you, you cannot afford any longer to be, do, be doing stuff that stops, you know, the grant finishes and things disappear. And, and as I mentioned, the skills, you need critical mass, you need the career structure, you need to build all that up. And, and as I said, to do that, we recognize that we have to take that outside of the facilities and put it in its own entity. So it's taken five or six years to make the argument, but now it's been bought into, and, and that will make the difference. Um, and I think that I think actually that applies, you know, whether I look at any other facilities 
I, I don't think the lesson is, is, is actually the same. You're going to have to do this in, in a different way than you would before. Uh, so it's, it's taken a while. Now I've started, as I said, I've been giving this talk for 20 years. Um, it's taken a while. There is still a long way to go, but I think at least as far as we're concerned, we've now made the case now. The only problem is that we have to do what we said we were going to do. Thank you.